Meine Maschine wackelt. Die Jagd war erfolgreich. One of the largest air battles of the Second World War took place in spring 1943 in the sky over Kubain. After the defeat in Stalingrad, the German troops were pushed back to Rostov and were partially consolidated on the Taman Peninsula. Covering access to the Crimea, the enemy established a powerful defense line. A Soviet sea-to-shore assault was launched, which gained a minor beachhead in the enemy's rear called the Male Zimla. The Germans undertook massive air raids to liquidate the threat from the rear in which over 500 aircraft took part. But the Soviet aviation as well concentrated up to 900 machines in that place. A sharp battle lasted over two months. It was there that the breakthrough in the struggle for the air superiority commenced. The main role in the battle for Kuban was played by the Soviet fighters of the new generation. Fighters. The Stormy Years. Moscow, Spring 1939. A big conference on aviation is held in Kremlin. The war in Spain has just ended, where the Soviet fighters fought against a new counterparty, the German BF-109 fighter designed by Willy Messerschmitt. This high-speed monoplane, equipped with a liquid-cooled engine, had an excellent aerodynamics. Military experts were very impressed by this aircraft. In result of the conference, assignments were issued to several design groups to build new fighters. However, out of a dozen of experimental aircraft, only three machines went into mass production. The design bureau of Alexander Yakovlev spent less than a year to design E-26 aircraft. It was equipped with the M105-1100 horsepower engine. This liquid-cooled engine was developed by a group of Vladimir Klimov. It had a relatively small cross-section, providing the fighter with a lesser drag. In January 1940, test pilot Julian Piankowski took the aircraft into the air. The start of the factory tests were hopeful. However, three months later, the first flight prototype got into a rack. Julian Piankowski died. Flights continued on two other prototypes and soon E-26 was passed over for the state tests. However, before their completion and in spite of numerous defects, it was decided to put the aircraft into mass production. Almost together with the Yakovlev's aircraft, E-301, a fighter designed by Simeon Lavochkin, Vladimir Gorbunov and Mikhail Gutkov, was put on tests. E-301 was equipped with the same engine as the E-26. The so-called Delta Wood, the pressed veneer saturated with phenol resins, was used in the aircraft construction. This material was heavier than wood, but had better strength, water resistance, and practically did not burn. In the end of March 1940, the dark cherry polished and sparkling E-301, nicknamed by the airfield jokers a grand piano, made its first flight. The aircraft was taken off by test pilot Alexei Nikashin. In the same days, another new fighter went into flight tests. The E-200 altitude high-speed interceptor was designed by Artyom Mikoyan and Mikhail Gurevich. The fighter was equipped with AM-35A engine designed by Alexander Mikulin. This engine was aimed for long-range bombers and had huge power, and although it was rather heavy for a fighter, it managed to provide the designed altitude characteristics. The tests of the new aircraft were conducted by test pilot Arkady Yekatov. The sample fighter reached the speed of 650 km per hour and became one of the fastest aircraft of that time. The practical ceiling of 12,000 meters was impressive as well. In comparison with E-153 and E-16 Polycarpus fighters already in service in the Red Army, the new aircraft had maximum speed of 120-150 km per hour more. This was reached thanks to more powerful engines and better aerodynamics. 
In August 1939, Germany and the USSR entered into a non-aggression pact. An agreement on economic cooperation was also signed, according to which Germany was supposed to supply samples of military technique to the Soviet Union. That's how in 1940 the brand new German aircraft appeared in the Soviet Union with the Messerschmitt 109E among them. This aircraft underwent thorough analysis in the Scientific Institute of the Air Force. In result, a report was prepared in which it was outlined that the German fighter was significantly faster than E-16, but was in general 50 km per hour slower than the new Soviet aircraft. The report emphasized technical perfection of the German fighter and that it was full of modern equipment and easy to control. Advantage of the German aircraft was that it was all made of metal. Due to lack of duraluminum, wood was used in the construction of the Soviet fighters, a more heavier material. But what to do? It was the only way to arrange mass production of the new machines. Serial production was performed in conditions of a tough time deficit. Factories could hardly keep up with the set plans and hurriedness influenced the quality of the end product. Serial aircraft characteristics often did not reach the set project data. A parade in commemoration of the October Revolution was held on the Red Square on November 7, 1940. International situation is tense and fraught with any surprises. German military representatives are among the invited guests. E-16 fly over the Red Square. Audience already got used to them. All of a sudden, a group of five sharp-nosed fighters passes at full speed. They were the Yakovlev's E-26. According to the procedures set in those times, all fighters were identified by a letter E. However, in November 1940, a decree was issued ordering all aircraft to be identified by the names of their designers. Thus, E-26 became Yak-1, E-301 became Lag-1, and E-200 became MiG-1. Later modifications of the Lavochkin and Mikoyan aircraft were identified accordingly as Lag-3 and MiG-3. They had larger fuel reserve. Each of the aircraft took its own niche in the sky. The light yaks were more suitable for battles at low and middle altitude. The heavy lags with their powerful weapons were better at destroying bombers and ground targets, while the MiGs were meant to fight at high altitude. With the uncertainty of the nature of the future war, such mutual support of the aircraft combat features meant a lot. It allowed to escape possible mistakes and to obtain a deeper use of the fighter aviation. Now only time was needed to complete the rearmament process. Year 1941, the June issue of the Deutsche Wochenschau. The German documentary film shows the first day of war on the Eastern Front. Heinkel 111 Luftwaffe bombers are in the sky. They fly deep into the Soviet territory. In those tragic days, the Soviet aviation suffered enormous losses. A lot of aircraft did not manage to even take off. In the very first day of the war, the Soviet Air Force lost around 1,200 combat aircraft. In the Western military districts, the better part of fuel depots and armed storages were destroyed and troops management was disintegrated. The surviving fighters were undertaking sporadic attempts to cover their striking aircraft and intercept the enemy bombers. They had to carry out tasks not typical for the fighters attacking German ground troops, which masses were in the offense along each and every road.
Right before the intrusion, Germany and its allies concentrated at the USSR border almost 5,000 combat aircraft, of which almost one-third were fighters. The Soviet Air Force had a significant numerical superiority. In five border military districts, there were almost 11,000 aircraft, of which around 5,000 were fighters. However, the majority of them were outdated. In spite of numerical superiority and intensive propaganda planting the idea of the Red Army's invincibility, officers and commanders feared to express any initiative in result of the wave of repressions that overwhelmed the country before the war. Besides, most of the Soviet pilots were poorly trained. Right before the war, the combat aircraft flight experience of an Air Force school cadet was reduced to only 15 hours, while a German cadet had no less than 80 flight hours. Air shooting and aerobatics were excluded from the Soviet cadet training program in order to reduce accidents. All this showed itself in the first months of the war. For instance, attacking a bomber, Soviet pilots would open fire at a distance and from an inconvenient angle. Absence of radio on most of the Soviet aircraft aggravated the hard situation even more. Luftwaffe completely dominated in the air. In some cases, the most experienced Russian pilots achieved success on the outdated E-16s. But in most of the cases, fighters were passive, deviating from direct confrontations with the enemy. E-16, with its weak armament and insufficient power-to-weight ratio, could hardly compete with Messerschmitt. Therefore, pilots had to conduct air battles at high speed using the E-16 better horizontal maneuverability. Sometimes a roundabout was used when aircraft were making a circle protecting one another. The Soviet aviation badly needed the fighters capable of countering the German Messerschmitt. However, production in the west of the country was urgently dismantled. The enemy was advancing at all fronts. The aircraft factories grant evacuation to the Urals and Siberia started. Fighters' production in new places developed in extremely hard conditions. Their production surpassed the pre-war level only by spring 1942. Problems with the product's quality remain since mainly women and teenagers having no sufficient qualification worked at the factories. They worked and learned to work. Production rate increased every day and soon replenishment of the Air Force became tangible. Rodina. Motherland. We solemnly swear to use all our strength, our blood, and our lives in fighting the enemy. One month after the start of the war, Luftwaffe aircraft performed the first air raid on Moscow. Almost 250 bombers were involved in it. However, the Moscow air defense was so powerful and well organized that the November German raids were practically stopped. The new Soviet fighters played an important role in this confrontation. This documentary film shows the Yak-1 squad performing a combat duty at Kubinka airfield near Moscow. This type of aircraft took part in combat actions from the first and through the last days of the war. 
of all fighters of the new generation, Yak-1 was the most light and maneuverable. Pilots valued it since it excused even very rough piloting mistakes. Among Yak's deficiencies was the one-piece wing, which complicated aircraft operation, transportation and repair. The fighter had a good armament of two rapid-firing Schkoss machine guns and a 20mm Schwach cannon. A later Yak-1B modification had better view, additional armor and more intense armament. The first series of this aircraft were equipped with five machine guns, the central was soon replaced with a cannon. Up to eight rockets or two bombs could be mounted beneath the wing. This fighter was most successfully used against bombers and at delivering ground attacks. Pilots appreciated the LOG's high vitality helping them survive in combat. And still the aircraft was rather heavy in piloting and not enough maneuverable. The MiG-3 advantage was that it could stay long in the air. It became important with the organization of the Moscow Air Defense. However, like with LAC-3, a substantial fuel reserve on board had negative impact on the aircraft maneuverability. At high altitude, it was superior than the German fighter. However, air fights were mostly conducted at middle and low altitudes where MiG had no advantage. Besides, MiG was poorly armed. It had two Schkoss machine guns of rifle caliber and one large caliber BS machine gun. In the age of the Moscow battle, there was a huge deficit of the ground forces support aircraft, so even the high-altitude MiGs had to be involved. For this purpose, they were equipped with rockets. We need the Il-2 attack aircraft and not the MiGs. Stalin's telegram to aircraft factory directors resolved the destiny of the Mikoyan aircraft. The motor factory providing engines for this fighter started to produce engines for the Il-2 attack aircraft, while MiG-3 production was stopped. However, MiG-3 continued to stay in service until 1944 and left a noticeable track in the history of the Great Patriotic War. To train young pilots, a modern training fighter was needed. Serial production of such aircraft, identified as Yak-7 UTI, was organized in Novosibirsk before the war. In the critical situation of 1941, an idea of turning this aircraft into a combat fighter was implemented. The aircraft was identified as Yak-7. The rear cockpit was preserved for transportation of technical staff and minor cargoes during air units relocation. It was also used to place an additional fuel tank or photographic equipment. Sometimes pilots used this cockpit to evacuate their comrades in arms after emergency landing. The most massive version of this fighter was the Yak-7B modification. Instead of the Schkoss, it was equipped with a large caliber machine guns. Its per second weight of fire was by one and a half times more than that of Yak-1. Designers of the Soviet fighters of the new generation based their work on the characteristics of their potential counterparty, BF-109E.
However, in reality, they had to confront a more developed version of Messerschmitt BF-109F, or Frederick as it was called. In comparison with Emil, the E modification Frederick had a more powerful engine and much better aerodynamic. Frederick differed from Emil by a more streamlined cowl and round off wing tips. Being equal with Emil, the new Soviet fighters yield in countering Frederick. The tactics of protecting Moscow from the Luftwaffe bombers required the use of fighters which could barrage in the air for a long time. That's how the heavy two-engine PE-3 fighter designed by Vladimir Pitlikov appeared. It was made on the basis of the PE-2 diving bomber in August 1941, just within four days. It should be pointed out that development of the two-engine fighters started before the war. They complied with the then-approved defensive doctrine pursuant to which masses of bombers made the basis of the Red Army's air power. A long-range escort fighter was required for their protection, so the two-engine aircraft was most suitable for that purpose. Design bureaus of Polikarpov, Tayyirov and Mikoyan were busy developing the escort fighter. These aircraft underwent tests already during the war. But reality changed priorities, and instead of advancing, we had to stay in defense, so the need for the escort fighters vanished by itself. The front line suspended for the winter period in the beginning of 1942 again started to move to the east. The Germans occupied Sebastopol and the Crimea and by September the Wehrmacht troops reached the Volga threatening to take over the entire Caucasus. At those difficult times, the aviation design bureaus kept working hard to upgrade combat aircraft. Designers had a precise order, no radical changes should be made which could have negative impact on the rate of serial production. One story is worth remembering in this connection. Before the war, speed was considered to be the main fighter's characteristic feature, and the liquid-cooled engine was thought to be able to provide it. However, with the start of combat actions, such engines proved to be vulnerable. An incidental shot would lead the whole system to overheating and blocking. Its alternative was an air-cooled engine. Arkady Shvitsov, designer of the M82 engine, put a stake on it. Its radial double-row cylinders with the same cross-section provided significantly more power. Shvitsov offered this engine to different aircraft designers, but reluctant to take risks, they refused. But one day Shvitsov met Lavochkin in one of the ministerial offices. The latter had a problem. Production of his LAC-3 fighter being insufficient in combat conditions was about to be stopped. In order to defend his creature, Lavochkin disobeyed the ban and made a radical effort. He substituted the liquid-cooled engine by the Shvetsov's M82. Interesting enough, this initiative was performed within an extremely short term. Equipped with a new engine, this aircraft passed the state tests within just five flight days. Thus, the famous LA-5 fighter appeared in spring 1942. Thanks to the new engine, the power-to-weight ratio of the fighter was significantly increased. In order to improve maneuverability, the wing was equipped with automatic slats. LA-5 combined high horizontal speed, good rate of climb, and vertical maneuverability, which differed it significantly from LAG-3. The aircraft was equipped with two Schwach cannons. The air-cooled engine turned into a kind of a pilot's protection from shots within the forward view. Using this feature, the pilots bravely performed front attacks, dictating the enemy the combat tactics of their own.
production of the new fighter significantly increased, and already in autumn the first regiments of these aircraft appeared in Stalingrad. LA-5 was quickly appreciated by the combat pilots. At the same time, a fighter with the air-cooled engine appeared in the Luftwaffe as well. It was Fokker Wolf 190. The Soviet pilots called it the Fokker, although it had no relation to Antony Fokker's company producing fighters in the First World War. The aircraft was created by a German designer, Kurt Tank. The A-4 modification of this aircraft was captured as a trophy in January 1943 and was thoroughly examined by the Air Force Research Institute. This training film was made in order to acquaint combat pilots with the new enemy. Focke Wolf 190 is the first German fighter with the air-cooled engine. The Germans think it's a phenomenal aircraft. This aircraft had a perfect armory and a powerful armament, including four 20mm cannons. It was a menacing combat aircraft and a serious counterparty to the Soviet fighters. It had advantage in the power unit control as well. A combined automatic control panel reduced the amount of levers. The pilot needs only a throttle control lever. It was more complicated to control the Soviet fighter. First set the required speed with the throttle, then use control lever to conform propeller with the set speed, and if the speed changes due to propeller waiting, then adjust it once again with the throttle. Both Yakovlev and Lavochkin were totally engaged in serial production. However, other designers whose aircraft were not put into production and who had enough time to create new fighters continued their work as well. Nikolai Polikarpov, for instance, was busy upgrading his E-185 fighter. The aircraft made its first flight before the war on January 11, 1941. In spring, it was equipped with the most powerful Soviet air-cooled engine designed by Shvitsov. It had 2,000 horsepower. These are the only snapshots where you can briefly see this perspective aircraft. To the right from Polikarpov is Pyotr Stefanovsky, the test pilot who conducted the state tests of the fighter in the end of 1942 in Novosibirsk. The aircraft showed excellent characteristics and was way much faster than any other fighter of that time. However, M-71 engine was not put into production. Then Polikarpov designed the E-185 version with the M-82 engine. This aircraft underwent tests almost together with the LA-5 and showed characteristics close to the latter. But the Lavochkin's aircraft had an advantage. It was a technological successor of the serial Log 3. This allowed to switch production to LA-5 almost with no time loss, while the works on E-185 were stopped. Mikoyan's prototypes had the same destiny. After the termination of the MiG-3 production, Mikoyan designed and built several fighters. They had perfect aerodynamics and powerful engines. Their flight characteristics were outstanding for their times. For instance, E-224 reached a ceiling of 14,000 meters, while E-225 reached a speed of 720 kilometers per hour. However, war was on its way. There was simply no time and resources for mastering new types of aircraft. In such circumstances, anyone would prefer a less perfect but ready for combat aircraft rather than a better but prospective fighter. The battle for Stalingrad became a breakthrough in the history of the Second World War. It was there that in 1942 the most mass-produced Yak-9 Soviet fighter appeared. The aircraft was based upon Yak-7B. By that time, it became possible to change some of the wooden parts for the metal ones, which significantly reduced the construction weight. 
combat pilots highly appreciated the new aircraft. It proved to be highly maneuverable, light and comfortable in control. Its maximum speed at low and medium altitudes was higher than of Messerschmitt 109F, but inferior to the Gustav modification of the latter, which also appeared at Stalingrad for the first time. It had a more powerful engine and by that time it became the fastest fighter at the Eastern Front. However, it gave way to Yak in maneuverability. The Yak production constantly grew. For instance, one of the factories was producing up to 20 such aircraft per day. However, such rush caused problems. On the eve of the historic Kursk battle in June 1943, a large number of fighters were suspended from flights due to several cases of the wing plywood cover rupture. Pilots died in accidents. The design bureau repair teams had to urgently eliminate this defect right at the front. A turning point in the war started in spring 1943. The Soviet troops were seen more and more in the offensive. This general tendency found its reflection in the aviation. The Soviet troops were advancing to the west faster and faster. Ground services could hardly prepare airfields on the return territories. Therefore, there was a need for a fighter with a larger flight range. A modification of the Yak-9D with the enlarged fuel tank's capacity started to appear in the Air Force units in the first half of 1943. Works continued on enhancing the fighter's firepower. A 37mm cannon was installed on Yak-9T. Here you can see its barrel installed in the propeller hollow rotor head. From a distance of half a mile, its projectiles were piercing 30mm tank armor. The letter T in the fighter's identification meant anti-tank. Combat introduction of Yak-9T produced a deep impression on the enemy and influenced certain air combat tactics. So far meeting Yaks, the German focke wolves were eager to perform frontal attacks. But when they realized how destructive the Yak-9T fire was, the Germans started to escape attacking any Jakoblivs aircraft, since in the air it was difficult to tell one modification from another. Yak-9K had even more powerful armament. It was armed with a 45mm cannon. Combat experience showed that one hit was quite enough to destroy any enemy's aircraft. However, due to unreliability of this cannon, the fighter was issued only in a limited version. Another modification was the Yak-9B fighter bomber. It could carry up to 400 kilos of bombs, just like the Il-2 attack aircraft. The bombs were placed inside the fuselage right after the pilot's cockpit, which changed neither the aerodynamics nor the speed characteristics of the aircraft. Absence of an adequate bomb site reduced the bombing efficiency, therefore only one air division was equipped with such aircraft. In 1944, aircraft factories started to produce Yak-9DD, the most long-range Soviet fighter of that time. Its fuel tanks contained so much fuel that the fighter's range increased up to 1,800 kilometers, which was twice as much as of the common Yak-9. Among the pilots, this modification was called the flying tank. In June 1944, the Soviet Yak-9 fighters were covering the Poltava Airdrome where the Allied bombers made landing in their shuttle raids on the enemy's facilities.
The most radical modification, YAC-9U, was introduced in the end of 1944. The upgraded version identified by the letter U had a more powerful engine and a better aerodynamics. This enabled the aircraft to reach a speed of 670 km per hour. The Yak-9 became the most mass-produced Soviet fighter. During the war years, its production, including all modifications, amounted to 15,500 aircraft. The best proof of the high appreciation of the Soviet fighter could be the words of the German ace Gerhard Backhorn, who said, I fought against all types of the Soviet aircraft, including those sent by Lend Lease. I think the best was Yak-9. The German pilot mentioned the Lend Lease aircraft. That was the name of the program upon which the Allies delivered the so much needed materials, hardware and food to the USSR. Among other things, the Soviet Union received firearms. The first foreign aircraft entering the air battles on the Eastern Front far back in 1941 was the British Hurricane Fighter. The Soviet pilots also flew the famous British Spitfire. The Red Army Air Force was also equipped with various modifications of the American P-40 fighter, the Tomahawk and Kitty Hawk. The most renowned foreign fighter in the Soviet aviation was the P-39 Air Cobra. Developing this aircraft, the American Bell Company designers applied several innovative solutions. The main peculiarity of the Air Cobra was the layout of its power unit. The engine was placed right after the pilot's cockpit. A master rod was going from the engine to the propeller. This allowed to put two large caliber machine guns and a 37mm cannon in the free front area of the fuselage. A perfect radio equipment was another advantage of this aircraft. However, Air Cobra was easy spinning but was hard to get out of the spin. Relevant recommendations to the combat pilots were provided after thorough tests at the Air Force Scientific Institute. Finally, Air Cobra became a real combat aircraft. The Soviet pilots liked it. It was easy to control and quite accessible for the pilots of medium qualification. The soon-to-be three-times hero of the Soviet Union, Alexander Pakrushkin, also flew Air Cobra. He was author of the famous air battle formula, Altitude Speed Maneuver Fire. Air Cobra capabilities, its power-to-weight ratio and firing power helped developing new vertical combat tactics. Close to the end of the war, there appeared a more sophisticated Cobra family fighter, the P-63 King Cobra. It also served in the Soviet Air Force and remained in service long after the war. In spring 1943, one of the decisive fights for the air superiority was the air battle in the sky of Kuban. Sometimes there were up to 40 air fights a day within a range of 30 kilometers involving up to 80 aircraft on each side. At that time, the enemy noticed the appearance of the new Soviet modification of LA-5 without the post-cabin fairing. It showed higher combat characteristics and proved itself equal with the German fighters. That was the LA-5F with a forced engine. A better view from the cockpit and the availability of the front and back armored glass differed this aircraft from the previous modifications. In the sky of Kuban, the German aviation had the latest modifications of Messerschmitt and Focke-Wulf. But the Soviet aviation was no more confused and amateurish as it was two years ago.
two equal counterparties faced each other in the sky. In combat actions, the pilots operated their aircraft at full throttle, and there were huge stress loads upon themselves. In order to assess the pilot's ability to control air situations, several experiments were conducted on a specially prepared LA-5 fighter of the Flight Research Institute. These snapshots were made during one of those flights. In the cabin is Sergei Anokhin. Behind him we can see accelerometers showing G-forces. 9G is almost the end point for the abilities of both the man and the aircraft. The next fighter version, LA-5FN, was put into production in March 1943. Scientists' recommendations on upgrading aerodynamics and thus increasing speed were implemented on this aircraft. The forced engine had direct fuel injection system. The mass use of this fighter started at the Kurske Duga battle, where Soviet pilots were opposed by the German Focke Wolves. Both aircraft already met in the air fights, and that's where the stakes were put on them. Tough battles showed that in spite of all its advantages, Focke Wolf 190 was inferior of LA-5FN. The Soviet pilots noticed that it was easier to fight against a Fokker Wolf rather than against a Messerschmitt. The Germans knew that as well. Until the very end of the war, Messerschmitt 109 remained the main Luftwaffe fighter. Yak-3 became one of the most renowned aircraft of the Second World War. It joined the combat actions in the middle of 1944. This aircraft combined all the best of its predecessors and became the top of the Yakovlev's piston engine fighter's evolution. Works on the new aircraft started in 1942. Yak-1 was taken for the bases. Aerodynamics was significantly improved, and when the more powerful M105 engine modification appeared, the military urged production of Yak-3. The aircraft had perfect controllability and was very easy to fly. It had no match in maneuverability. It would have been an excellent fighter if not for its relatively minor fuel capacity. The experimental Yak-3 with the powerful BK-108 engine became the fastest Soviet piston engine aircraft. In the end of 1944, it reached the speed of 745 km per hour, which was just a bit less than the Messerschmitt 209 record set in 1939. The French pilots of Normandy and Neman flew Yak-3 in the last 10 months of the war. After the war, the Soviet government donated the fancy aircraft to the French pilots and they flew them back home. Forty fighters served in the French Air Force without a single accident until 1956. This Yak-3 is placed in the Paris Museum of Aviation as a symbol of the Soviet-French unity in fight against fascism. Together with the Yak-3 development, Air Force units started to receive LA-7, the most advanced Lavochkin fighter of the wartime. It represented a further development of the LA-5FN aircraft. Its perfection went in a traditional way, weight production, aerodynamics improvement, firepower enhancement. The aircraft was armed with three synchronized 20mm cannons. In comparison with the latest German fighters modifications, LA-7 showed a better rate of climb. 
No matter at what altitude LA-7 would be flying, it was always ready to take position above the enemy. The new aircraft went to the Guards regiments in the first place. The ace pilot Ivan Kozhidub, fighting in one of such regiments on the new fighter, brought down 17 German airplanes, including the Messerschmitt 262 jet aircraft. By the end of war, the aviation of the Soviet Army had suppressing air superiority. The Soviet pilots practiced the so-called free hunting, the tactics used by the Germans in the beginning of war, which predetermined results of the Luftwaffe aces. The war in Europe ended with the seizure of Berlin, and in this last battle the fighter pilots played a significant role. It was a victory not only for the front, but for the rear as well. During the war times, the Soviet industry produced over 60,000 fighters. On June 24, 1945, the long-awaited victory parade took place. That day, the hero pilots split. Some of them were waiting in the cabins of their aircraft for a takeoff order, but the order did not come. Due to bad weather, the air parade was not performed. The others, paying no attention to the rain, marched through the pavement of the Red Square. The country admired its hero. The last serial piston engine fighters entering into the Soviet Air Force service were LA-9 and LA-11. LA-9 was first shown to public at an air parade in Tushin in 1948. Spectators were demonstrated group aerobatics on LA-9. The all-metal LA-9 possessed high characteristics thanks to improved aerodynamics. In the first place, this was achieved through the application of the wing laminar profiles which reduced aerodynamic drag. The aircraft had an impressive armament of four 23mm synchronized cannons. For the first time, the Soviet fighter obtained advanced radio navigation equipment, including the fixed-loop radio compass and the friend or foe identification equipment. LA-9 was accepted for service in 1947. At the same time, the first jet fighters started to appear in the aircraft units. However, they were not yet reliable, had minor flight range, and required good airfield. So when in the second half of the 40s, the Arctic Ocean was turned into a confrontation arena between the former allies, the piston engine Lavochkin fighters were brought into action. The shortest route for exchanging bomb attacks between the Soviet Union and the United States went through the Arctic Ocean. Development of ice airdromes started there from which heavy bombers were supposed to take off carrying nuclear charges against America. On the opposite side of the North Pole, Americans conducted the same activities. Therefore, fighters were also based on the ice airdromes. Their main task was to protect those fields from air attacks and to intercept American bombers. LA-9 exactly suited this role. It only needed an extended flight range. That's how the LA-11 fighter appeared. It had a fuel capacity that could provide it with a range of 2,500 kilometers. It could perform a record long stay in the air for seven hours. And again up in the air, once again to the north. The Soviet combat aircraft keep an unbreakable front line. They approach the North Pole. The roaring engines wake up the sleeping polar desert. The North Pole is reached. The brave Soviet Falcons perform slapping aerobatics saluting its powerful motherland and its great leader Stalin. 
великого Сталина. On May 8, 1948, for the first time in history, the Soviet fighters landed in the vicinity of the North Pole. The men and their aircraft successfully achieved this difficult task. In the years of war, the piston engine fighters reached the top of their perfection. The maximum speed of serial aircraft increased by an average of 100 km per hour. But progress demanded to fly even faster. And now these piston engine beauties, having approached their speed limit, were inevitably supposed to give way to the new jet fighters capable of stepping beyond the limit. The era of jet aviation was about to start.